Good morning. Please open up your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. How many of you remember the, um, I don't know if you call it a saying or the lesson, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Okay. That's good advice to give to our children, good advice for us to follow as well. But there's a flip side to that. Names are very important. There's no doubt about it. Names have significance. And this is where we are today in our journey through the Bible as we dig into the Ten Commandments and look for the keys that God wants us to stand for. You know, we talked about this over the past couple of weeks, how many Christians are known for what we stand against. We're anti this, anti that, uh, a list of rules, a list of do's and don'ts. But it's a whole lot more than that. And the Ten Commandments were not given to us to be a list that we memorize and tape up and then walk away from. The Ten Commandments were given to us to separate us from those that don't believe in the Lord. And that's what we've been kind of looking at. Today, we look at the life key of reverence. As we look at Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, it says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. That word vain there as a noun, means empty and void of value. And when it's used in a sense of a verb like it is here, it means to treat something as common or worthless. We devalue God's name when we take holy things lightly, when we tell God jokes, or when we use His name in a flippant way. It it robs us of the majesty and holiness of God. And it shows disrespect and irreverence toward Him. Everything that comes out of our mouths it should meet the standard that God has for us. And we live in a society, though, that's kind of opposed to that. We live in a society that um, says, well, I'm going to say it the way I want to say it. I'm going to talk the way I want to talk. I'm going to go by my standard. How many of you have ever seen the movie Gone with the Wind? A few years ago, they had the 50th anniversary of Gone with the Wind. And the big news article that came out was the public outcry when Clark Gable said a inappropriate word, and it was the word damn, and he used it in a non-biblical way. The word damn is in the Bible, but it's used in a specific way. He did not use it that way. And there was a huge outcry about that one word. Today, if the word damn is in a movie, and that's the only word that's there, it's probably rated G, because we've acclimated ourselves. Our society has taken it as, you know, it's okay to say certain words, even though they were deemed inappropriate at one time. I suspect that if we removed all cheap and profane words from the English language, some people would have difficulty forming a complete sentence. And I say that based on something that Colonel Sanders said before he died. He was the founder of KFC, and he said this. He said that at his conversion to Christ, that his conversion to Christ cost him half of his vocabulary. That's probably true for some people. So we're not going to go down this road too far about every profane word or every cuss word because the verse is very, very clear that it's specifically talking about God's name. However, my prayer is that we all come to the same conclusion that King David came to in Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Our words give people a view into what's in our hearts. I like the way Warren Worsby put it. He said, what's down in the well comes up in the bucket. I love that saying because it is so true. Jesus said some different versions of that. He said, you know, a tree is known by the fruit that it bears. And he did talk about a well. He, you know, you don't get dirty water from a clean well. And that's absolutely true. We need to be careful. So with regards to God's name, what's down in the well? That's our question for today. With regards to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the King of Kings, what is down in the well? Because that's what's going to come out of our mouths. The holy name. And at that name, angels bow down. Demons tremble at it. And humans are saved by that name. It is a name above every name. His name is holy. And names are important. You know, the name Trump may open up doors to the financial world. Einstein opens up doors to brilliance. Michelangelo opens up doors to the arts. But the name of Jesus Christ opens up the doors to heaven for you. And for me, Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon what? 
the name of the Lord shall be saved. And again, we go here every week. It's not just a magic prayer, but it shows the significance. His name is the only name whereby we can have salvation. It is the only name. I know we live in a world that people say, well, you know, that may work for you, but it doesn't necessarily work for me. And that's a rough place to be because God gets to determine who enters his house and how we enter. So there's not a multitude of ways to get to heaven according to our Lord. And that is where we have to be today. You know, we honor military generals like MacArthur, Patton, and Schwarzkopf. We honor spiritual leaders like Billy Graham, Jerry Falwell, and J. Vernon McGee. We honor names of great leaders like Washington and Jefferson and Lincoln. How much more should we honor the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? Psalm chapter 8 verse 1 says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth who has set thy glory above the heavens. There is no name like his. It's the greatest name in heaven and earth. And when we take it lightly... And when we talk flippantly about it or use God jokes or anything that's even remotely down that road, we're taking a big chance. We're using his name improperly because names are significant. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 22 verse 1 says, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. The name, your name is important. I think Brian and I talked about this one day where, you know, our dads used to say something that, you know, the only thing you came into in this world with was your name, and you better walk right. You better walk in with integrity, because you can't get your name back, my dad used to say. What you do to your name follows you the rest of your life. Names are important. Let me rattle off some names, and call out the first thing that comes to your mind. I know this is a dangerous thing, but we're going to give it a shot, okay? We'll start off very, very easy. Judas, betrayer, traitor, bad, good, okay. How many of you are thinking about naming your child Judas in the future? Why not? It's not a bad. It's an easy to spell. You know, okay. Uh, how about this? Ready? Hitler. Killer. Murderer. Yeah. Okay. Not too many of you are going to name your child Hitler. Let's go on the other end. How about Mother Teresa? Servant. Yeah. Servant. Selfless. Uh, that's what comes to my mind. How about this? How about... It's super easy. George Washington. First president. Somebody said honest. Who said honest? Well, he chopped on a cherry tree and he, you know, supposedly and said, I did it, you know. Name comes into our mind. We instantly think of something. We instantly associate something with the name, okay? What comes to mind when we hear the name of God? Now, the Bible has over 300 names for God, and there's a reason for that because it's impossible to explain him. It's impossible to encompass him with just one name. So he's called by over 300 names in the Bible, and they capture some of the character of who he is. And I got just a couple of them up here. Some of my favorites. Genesis 2, 4 calls him Elohim, the Lord strong and mighty. Genesis 22, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Exodus chapter 3, Yahweh, the eternal God of all. Nehemiah chapter 10, Adonai, the sovereign Lord of lords. I got a couple more here for you. And like I said, there's over 300. We could be here a long time, but take a look at this. El Shaddai in Exodus chapter 6, the almighty God. Judges chapter 6. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. Psalm chapter 7, Elion, the Lord most high. And the New Testament calls him Jesus the Christ, which is Lord, our Savior and Messiah. Our name significant in general? Absolutely. But the most significant name in all of history is the name of our God. There are so many more. And each one of them talks about his character and who he is. And when we use his name in any version of it in the scripture, when we use his name lightly or in vain, we devalue that. And we miss out on the majesty and holiness of God. And we show him irreverence and disrespect. So, as we work our way through the perfect ten commandments, we're going to see, we're looking at what we should stand for as children of God. We need to stand for his holy name. We could do that in three significant ways. The first way is reverence God's name continually. Reverence God's name continually. Let me ask you a question. And I, I've promised you a long time ago that I would let you know if I'm asking you a trick question. So I'm letting you know that I'm asking you a trick question right now. When is a Christian a Christian? Everybody's thinking, okay, this is a trick question. What is he asking us? When is a Christian a Christian? Okay, you become a Christian the moment you follow Christ. But from that point on, when is a Christian a Christian? 
Always. That's right. Continually. It doesn't stop. I can't say, okay, today I'm going to be a Christian and go out and try to live right. And then the next day, yeah, yesterday didn't go too well. Today I'm not going to be. I'm just going to be what I want to be. No. When we become a child of God, one of the things that we rest in is the fact that God saves us and saves us forever. We can't lose our salvation. Well, if we can't lose our salvation, then that means the responsibility is on us to always continually walk according to his standards. We want to reap the benefits. We need to follow the responsibility of living the way he wants us to live. So we need to reverence God's name continually. That is to use it carefully, with respect, lovingly. Use it as an act of worship, not anything else. We can't be flippant about the way we say the name of God. Psalm 29, verse 2 says, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto His what? His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let me ask you this. Does it bother you when somebody uses the Lord's name in vain? I got to tell you, before I first got saved, I heard, I'm sure I heard His name used that way a lot. As soon as I came to the Lord Jesus Christ, all of a sudden I started hearing that. I started recognizing it. And it did something inside of me. It turned my stomach inside. And I thought, I I stepped back and said, wait a minute. Are these guys talking like this now all of a sudden because I know Jesus Christ? And then I had to step back and say, no, they've always talked this way. But before, when I had earthly ears, it didn't matter. But now that I'm a child of God, all of a sudden, it's offensive. It's vile. And... It should be defended. We need to defend it. We need to stand for it. I've mentioned to people who have used his name that way, family members, hey, I'd appreciate it if you don't talk that way. And they get all indignant. Who are you to tell me how to talk? Well, I happen to be his son. And according to my Bible, I have the responsibility and the authority to tell you to shut your mouth and don't talk about my father that way. I had to stand for his name. We're supposed to do that. Erwin McManus tells a story about when his son went to a Christian camp and his son got into a fight and Erwin drove down there to uh, pick up his son. You know, he wanted to be a good dad. He said, son, why did you get into a fight with this boy at a Christian camp? I mean, for crying out loud, I'm the pastor of the church nearby and what are you doing? And the boy said, dad, I did get into a fight and I'll do it again too. His father said, oh no, my son's got a rebellious heart. What am I going to do? He said, well, what was it about? He said, dad, I'm not going to let anybody talk about my mother that way. All of a sudden, Erwin wrote in the book, he said, now I wanted to fight. (laughs) Why? Why is that so important? He was standing for something. We need to stand for the name of our God. Philippians chapter 2.10 says that at the name of Jesus Christ, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. His name is so powerful so incredible, so holy and righteous and pure that just at the mention of it, all of heaven will drop to its knees. All of earth will drop to its knees. Every single knee will bow and every single tongue will confess the name of Jesus Christ. We need to be reminded the translators of the Bible before the printing press, scribes had to hand copy God's word. And it was obviously a long, long process. But every time they would encounter a name for God, they would rise up, they would go and change their clothes and bathe, they would get a brand new quill, write his name, then burn the quill, feeling that now that the quill wrote his name, it was far too holy to use for anything else. And they would do that every single time. Sometimes they would come to his name two, three, or even four times in one verse. And every time they would stop, they would go and bathe, change their clothes, get a new quill, write the name, burn the quill, get another one. That's the reverence that they have for his name. And some people say, well, isn't that a little bit overkill? Absolutely not. If anything, we are way too far the other way today and we use his name just any old way we want. Yet you see the majesty that they saw in his name and the way they transcribed it. Imagine how long that would take. Incredible. But they reverenced his holy name. We need to reverence his name continually. Now, I understand that we are a faith family and 
most, if not everyone here, has come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I understand that. So this one, actually, if we stopped here, this one would be pretty easy. If you've known the Lord for any amount of time, it probably reviles you to even think of using His name unholy. So, so far, we're thinking, piece of cake. And if it stopped here, it would be. But we go further. Not only are we supposed to reverence God's name continually, but we're supposed to represent God's name honorably. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 says, Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I've said before, if we have the audacity to call ourselves by His name, then we need to live our lives in audacity for His name. You guys, how many of you dads, think about this, how many of you dads ever said to your son, hey, you know, you're carrying on the name, family name, make sure you do it right, right? We say that kind of stuff to our kids and we mean it. You know, my dad sat me down with it and said, you better live up to your name. You better walk right. You better be a good example of me. And I used to think, that's an awful big burden to put on a kid, (laughs) you know? But now I understand. Now I understand. Because I am to represent my Father's name honorably. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. What is the essence of God's name? It's holy. It's separate. It's pure. It's righteous. And if we're going to have the audacity to call ourselves Christian, we better walk that way and act that way honorably. You know, the greatest hindrance to lost people being saved is not that they don't understand the gospel is that they don't understand the people who claim to have the gospel. They don't understand us. They don't understand how we can be one way one day and another way another day. And, you know, some people say, well, are they really watching us that much? They are. You let somebody know that you're a believer, a child of God, all of a sudden the microscope comes out and you are in that fishbowl and they're waiting for you to trip up. I know because I used to be on the other end of it. There was a guy that I worked with at the construction plant. He said that he was a believer, said that he was a Christian. I watched him every moment of every day I had a chance. And he did trip up here and there. I catch him. I call him. Hey, Mike, I thought you said. And I catch him on it. And I rub it in his face like the rotten, nasty person that I was. I say, you say that you're this, but you're a hypocrite. And he looked at me and, you know, he said, no, I'm really sorry. I'm not perfect. And I walked away. I'm like, yeah, that's right. You know. And it's all cocky and arrogant, prideful, disgusting. Well, yeah, that's right. I remember one time in particular, he was putting this big vibrating machine on top of a mole. We did concrete. And it was huge. It was shaped, the whole mole. I mean, like massive. And it fell off and landed on his foot. And I was standing next to him, and I went like this. I wanted to hear what was coming out of his mouth. And he began a word that I cannot repeat here. And he was like, and then he stopped. And I walked away thinking, oh, I almost got him. That's how bad I was. I wanted to catch him in it. But I'll tell you what. You let somebody know you're a child of God, you are being watched. And the way you act and the way you conduct yourself is significant in what the kind of authority, the kind of opportunity you're going to have to lead them to the Lord sometime in the future. That's what we're being told here. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 says this. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Walk worthy of the calling of Jesus Christ upon your life. How many of you want to reap the benefit of being a Christian by one day going to heaven? Oh, my goodness. It's incredible. we got some responsibility here. Our works don't get us to heaven, but we work because we're going to heaven. It's a beautiful thing. And we need to walk worthy of this name. As representatives of God on earth, it's our duty to the King of kings and the Lord of lords to walk honorably according to his name. Paul put it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We need to walk a certain way. We were created to be separate, to represent God's holy name honorably. Many of you have heard the name Daniel Webster. At one time, Mr. Webster was considered the greatest of all living Americans. He was an outstanding statesman, lawyer, orator, a leader of men. And one time, 25 national leaders came together to have a banquet for him. And one man at the banquet said, Mr. Webster, sir, what's the greatest thought that ever entered your mind? Without hesitation, this is what he said. 
He said, the greatest thought that ever entered my mind was the thought of my responsibility to God. As he spoke, he wept. And he excused himself from the banquet. Then he came back into the room. And when he came back in, he spoke at length for about 30 minutes on the holiness of God and how we're supposed to conduct ourselves accordingly. Oh, I wish we had leaders like that today. I'll tell you. I wish we were represented by people like that today. I really and truly do. But we can do that in our homes, in our workplace, in our schools, in our community. We can represent God's name honorably. And then there's another step, one final step. And that is to rely on God's name totally. Rely on God's name totally. Trust is a very rare commodity today, isn't it? It's difficult with the economic situation the way it is, with the moral failings of leadership in all venues, whether it's the church or the school system or the government, with the threat of war always on the horizon. It's tough to trust. Our teenagers face that. I read these surveys that go out that George Barner does, and they always come back. And one of the top three, every single year after year after year, teenagers have difficulty with trust, trusting someone. And we need to be able to rely on, to trust in God's holy name, totally and completely. There's a story of a a man, they called him Uncle Oscar. And Uncle Oscar did not want to fly, never wanted to fly. Some of you may have parents or grandparents that, you know, they wouldn't even step foot in a plane, okay? And he had no choice, he had to fly. And his friends on the other end of the trip couldn't wait to hear about his experience flying. And they asked him, and he said, well... It wasn't as bad as I thought it might be. But I'll tell you this. I never did put all my weight down. I don't know how he did that. But it's kind of a good illustration for us about how we are with Christ. We never completely put our weight down. There was a Bible translator down in the deep reaches of African jungle. And he was translating the Bible into their native language, their tribal language. And he got stuck on the word faith. They didn't have a word for faith in this language. And as he was struggling with it, he was praying about it, one of the natives came in and collapsed in a chair in the guy's room. He was kind of, ah, he was exhausted. And he used a word that meant, it feels good to rest all of my weight in this chair. That was the word that he used for faith. As he was translating it, to rest all of what we are in the capable hands of our Lord and God and Savior. We need to stand for His holy name. We need to rely on it continually. Psalm 33, verse 21 says, Our heart shall rejoice in Him because we have trusted in His holy name. Here's a big question. Do we really believe God is who He says He is? That's really the big question. The big question today is not what's going to happen to our economy, what's going to happen over in the Middle East, what's going to happen with the weather. That stuff's secondary. The real question is, Do we really believe God is who He says He is and can do what He says He can do? That's going to determine whether or not we walk in victory or defeat. That's going to determine whether or not we're going to walk in holiness or unrighteousness. Do we truly believe God is who He says He is and can do what He says He can do? Ephesians chapter 3 beginning of verse 20, says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above what we ask or think. In other words, your imagination can't even begin to touch the limits of God's power, which there are none. According to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You see, when we rely on God, who gets the glory? God. And that's why we're here in the first place. I remember a few years ago, my son Johnny was, I think he was standing on the counter in our kitchen. And I was kind of turned away. I was emptying out the dishwasher. And I heard, Dad, catch. And I turned at the last minute and he jumped on top of me. And, um, you know, I scrambled to catch him. I did some acrobatics and caught him. And we both landed on the ground, though. He landing on me. Laughing, having a great time, me, achy-breaky, on the ground thinking, I can't believe you just did that. And I asked him, I said, Johnny, what are you doing? Why did you do that? Why would you jump off the counter onto me? This is what he said. It was very deep, 
very profound. I think at the time he was four. He said, you're my daddy. He got up and ran away. And I'm thinking, that's your answer? You almost killed the both of us because I'm your daddy? But then after a while, I thought, wow, wait a minute. Why did you jump like a crazy person with no safety gear? Why? Because I'm your daddy. And I thought, I need to live my life in such a way that honors God, that relies on God, simply because he's my daddy. And he is who he says he is, and he can do what he says he can do. John still thinks I'm Superman. And that's a good thing. And once he gets to be a teenager, he'll realize that I'm not, and, you know, and all that will be fun. And, but as of right now, he thinks I could do anything. His faith in me sometimes is greater than my faith in the one who can do anything. And it's humbling. We need to rely on God. Trust in him. And that trust that Johnny showed to me that day brought a pretty big smile to my face. And I got to wonder, when we rely on the name of the Lord totally, are we bringing a smile to his face as well? Good question. So let me ask you this. How vital is the name of God in your life? Think about that. Think about that through the week. You know, no. Would any of us use his name improperly? Probably not. Okay? But remember, God's standards are a whole lot higher than what the Pharisees... See, the Pharisees felt that that was good enough. We're not going to use God's name in vain. We're not going to say anything, so we're good to go. Jesus came and elaborated and said, No, 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 you're missing it. There's something for you to stand by. Something you need to stand for. Stand for His holy name. How many of you have heard the name William Booth? Right? The founder of the uh, Salvation Army. When he was dying there were some legal papers that needed to be signed for his will and all that. And the lawyer said to Mrs. Booth, he said this, he said, if you can get him to sign these papers, the will will be executed much more smoothly when he's gone. Well, there was a problem. William Booth was in such bad shape that he was in and out of consciousness. But miraculously, he was able to grasp a pen and begin signing. Now, William Booth was a man known for living for Christ, most of his life, sacrificing what he was for the name of Jesus Christ. And on his deathbed, he's supposed to sign his name to these papers. And he finished, he got through to the end, and the lawyer said, that's good enough, okay. And he took the papers, folded them up, and put them in his briefcase. Shortly after that, William Booth died. Later, the lawyer brought the papers back to his office, opened up the papers, and found out that there was a big problem. Not only did William Booth not write his name properly, but he didn't write his name. On every line was the name Jesus. Even in his dying moments, the name of Jesus Christ eclipsed everything else in this man's life. What an incredible testimony. Incredible. The only name on his mind as he's dying is the name of his Lord and Savior. And the question posed to us today, through his word, Is the name of God valuable enough for us to live for and die for no matter what? Let's pray. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I want to ask you a question. Do you reverence the name of our Lord Jesus Christ? Have you accepted, have you come to know Him through His name? My Bible says that it's through the name of Jesus Christ that we are saved. Have you called upon that name? Have you surrendered to that name? Does that name mean more to you than anything else? If you have not, let me ask you, are you willing to place your faith, your trust, and your hope for all eternity in the name of Jesus Christ? The fact that He came down from heaven, took on the form of a human being, lived the perfect life, died, innocently died for your sins and mine, and rose again on the third day. Do you believe that? Do you trust in that? Are you willing to stake your eternity on that which we read in this Bible? If you have not done that, my Bible says you can do it right now. It says right now you can call upon the name of the Lord. And you do that by prayer, by speaking to Him. And I'm going to lead you in that right now. So if you're here and you would like to do that, if you're not sure that you have a home in heaven, but you want to be sure, God's Word, don't trust me, trust Him. God's word says, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. I'm going to help you do that right now. 
right now, right where you are, quietly to yourself, you can pray just like this. He'll hear you. You can say, Lord, I have sinned. I am not perfect. And I am sorry. Now say this. Say, Lord, right now, as best as I know how, I don't want some fake religion. I don't want some belief system of do's and don'ts. I want a relationship with you. And right now, Lord, I place my faith, my hope, my trust in you now and forever. Now everyone's head is bowed, everyone's eyes are closed. If you prayed that prayer with me and you prayed it from your heart, my Bible says you're a new creature. My Bible says your name, your name is now written in heaven and can never be erased. And I'd like to pray for you. No one else looking around, just myself. If you just prayed that prayer with me, could you do me a favor right where you are? Lift up your hand. You can put it right back down. I'll see who you are. Just lift it up and put it right back down. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for who you are. Father, I ask that you help each and every one of us leave here today and live according to your holy name. Help us, Father, to bring glory, honor, and praise to you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day.